We're here at Sundance with Jake Paltrow, whose film Young Ones premiered here this week at the Sundance Film Festival. And thanks for talking to uh, the playlist. Sure, of course. Um, congratulations. I think this is a really ambitious, totally unique film. Um, and it's, it was a com it's a, just a completely unique story hatched from your inventive mind. So um, I've been calling it a futuristic western, which I think people Great. were calling it. So, but how do you describe it to people when you're t when you're doing your pitch? That's that's a good start. I guess I I was saying for a while that it was just a western, um, but I, a futuristic western is because it, it didn't. I don't think it, I initially set out to to really make a western. I think it initially, in my mind, it felt more like a, like a sci-fi movie. Mm -hmm. um, even though it was really a chamber piece between these, this family and these characters, I always thought of it as you know, a chamber piece, a science fiction sort of chamber piece. Uh -huh. And then as we started putting it together and going to the environment and figuring out the locations where we're at, it very quickly presented itself. Um, as a Western, and then, you know, and I guess I, maybe in general, that's sort of my approach with these movies, with actors and other things, is I sort of like to bring the movie to the, the thing, you know? Uh -huh. And so I think this became more of a Western as I prepared to make it. Well, there were so many of the choices that you made in there that were like the long fades and the yeah. and the dramatic, the music, and right. you know, it was really a kind of a John Williams esque score. Right. It just it just felt kind of old fashioned, but in a good in a good way. But then had these futuristic touches, which was really interesting. Um, and so, did, was that those all conscious choices that yeah, you those, were making? Yeah, those were things I thought about. I think even those dissolves were even written into the script. I really like that in movies when you have that sort of long, you see one image drift away, yeah. you know, like a 10 second dissolve. Yeah, they were long, yeah. And you have some of them really, and as long as there's enough going on on either side of them, you know, trying to, you know, I always like that people are still talking as the dissolve starts. That's something I always loved. Huh. There's a great one, there was a great one in Full Metal Jacket, you know, when, um, uh, there, I don't know. There's a great one film on Jacket where it's early on. It's in the no, I'm sorry. It's in the it's in the second act. Uh -huh. And I think the guy says, "In the uh, I, my present duties keep me where I belong. In in the rear with the gear." And he's and it's, he's always saying it as this is all sort of happening. Uh -huh. So that's sort of where it's, you know something like that. Because so many movies now are just like frenetic cut 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 yeah. cut cut you know action. And I just thought I liked that it felt it felt kind of I don't know refreshing in a way. Um, so tell us how it got started. Like where did this inspiration from the story come from? And was it brought on, you know, I, I was seeing how there's, I just heard that California just declared a drought yeah. emergency. A um, story two days ago. Yeah, a huge story. So, um, where did this come from in your brain? Well, it started with those kinds of stories. Uh -huh. Now, most of those stories were outside of our country when I started writing this. Um, in 2008, the two big stories that started my sort of interest in, in, in putting a movie in a landscape like this was, the first one was in Yemen. They were talking about moving the capital because the water was going to run out in 10 years. Wow. And the other was a story about this town in Chile that they called the driest town in the world. And people had stayed behind, and they were trucking water in to the town. And they were asking them sort of why they stayed. They all stayed for these really unusual personal reasons that I was sort of fascinated by. Was so, it tied to the land, or what was what were, what it, were their reasons? It, most of the reasons yeah. were really tied to that it's going to change. It's yeah. going to get better. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love if there was like a follow-up story now to see like if anything has happened. Yeah. 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 Um, and then there were stories that were sort of starting in our, and as I wrote it and was trying to get it made, you know, a lot of the stories were starting to happen here. You know, it was two years ago, it was in Texas, and last year it was in Texas a lot, you know, um, and this year it's California. The last couple of years it's been California, but yeah. this year it feels like the first time, the culmination of the last few years. I mean, the idea that they're going to let 200,000 acres in Central California go fallow this year because there's no water to irrigate it. Really? It's pretty scary. Yeah. I mean, you know, you get a couple more years of that. You know, I don't know what that spells. Yeah, and, and with all the fires that are happening, I mean, in Colorado and sure. in Arizona or all those different places, yeah, it's pretty scary. So you know, ours is obviously not a um, a reality reality right. sort of sort of movie. It's very storybook in a lot of ways, but it has these elements of things that are you know, if not plausible, possible, or, uh -huh. or vice versa. Uh -huh. You know. Um, so then was it just fun to stick in the futuristic kind of things, like yeah. with the simulate and which maybe you can tell the audience about the simulate. Yeah, well that was something, I mean, I've sort of always been sort of interested in robotics and initially I wanted to use this real robot um, um, called Big Dog that was made by this company, Boston Dynamics, and I sort of reached out to them and I got to spend a little bit of time with them, I actually get to spend a little time with Big Dog. Um, and so robotics is just something that, that I'm interested in and for this movie, um, you know, most movies, when, or not most, but a lot of movies when they deal with 
robotics, they often are very interested in does the machine have a soul mm -hmm. sort of approach. And that was something I'm just, I'm not very interested in, but I'm very interested in what the characters sort of imbue right. the machine sort of with. And in this film, you know, the sense of blame and the sort of blame for the central event in the, right. in the film, I think is really, really interesting. And and you see that a bit in, in, in uh, manufacturing and interest industry now, the idea of machines taking away jobs. And when you take the sort of sentient element out of the machinery, which you know, a lot of these science fiction movies make sort of the central conceit or the central point of dealing with robotics, in some ways it even becomes more human because it's really just about what we feel about. Yeah, I mean, the whole audience is like, oh, well, right, you know, right. at certain points, we don't want to see it get beaten up even though it's a machine. And, exactly. Yeah. But in ours, it's sort of, you know, is it feeling any sort of pain? Or what are you know, what, what are the feelings? What, are feelings? what does that even mean? You right. Know, in our fiction. Um, so you've been working on this movie for many moons. It sounds like uh, you just mentioned years. 2008. So yeah, tell us well, about that's the... Where it started, but yeah. Tell us about the journey. Why did it take so long? What very hard to get money, you know, to make yeah. these movies, and um, and it takes a long time, and you get like, it, and it takes a long time to get actors to read them, mm -hmm. and so you know, I mean, I think we finally started having after like two and a half, about uh, two years, you know, two years to start to get some actors involved in the picture, we sort of signed on. Who came on first? L was the first. Uh huh. I think it was L, and then it was Nicholas. Well, there was some different. Act no, no. L was the first. Then there was a different actor for a little bit who was going to play the father. Uh huh. And then, and then he fell out right before we were going to do it. And then that, that's when I got Michael. Really. Yeah, I mean, he's. I mean, he's the, who's the greatest? Right. I mean, I couldn't imagine that movie without him in it. So. Me neither. Yeah. No, that's one of those. You know, and that's the other thing. You know, not that I totally believe in the things are you know meant to be or the reason behind everything, but. Sometimes there is something really interesting about just letting it be the way it's going to be. Yeah. In this case, obviously, we got lucky, right. and we ended up with this incredible cast. Yeah. So, Mike was the last one. So I think it was L, Nicholas, and Cody. Maybe it went in that order. Um, I mean, Cody McPhee has been doing amazing work over the last few years. He's really a standout, and so, I mean, he's a he's really great in this film. Can you talk about what he's like to work with and how he's it's just so it's such a gifted kid? Yeah. Just naturally, or does it? Yes. Mm -hmm. He has that. That, that gene, you know, um, it's like just watching somebody where it's none of it's that hard for him, you know. If, uh -huh. if, you, if you even just in playful conversation, if he if he slips into an accent or one of those sorts of things, like it's it's perfect, uh -huh. you know. Like we shot in South Africa, you know, he'll do a perfect South African accent. Uh -huh. um, you know, he was just in Scotland finishing this movie that he's doing with Michael Fassbender. It's like every every. Thing he does is just sort of perfect. Huh. Um, just one of these really good How old things. is he now? 17. 17. When you shot, he was 15 ish or 16? He was 16 when uh -huh. we shot. I think we first auditioned, he was fifth, just turned 15 maybe. And and I was very worried. So the movie fell apart. We, we were about, we were, we were going to shoot it in Spain at one point. And about three weeks before we were going to start, it, it stopped. That was very hard. And when we got it reconstituted, and we're going to go to South Africa, um, I was very worried that Cody was going to be too old. Right. But he, but he was. Yeah. We sort of talked through it again. It's just so, it's so good. To so tell me about filming. You filmed in South Africa. It feels like the American West. Why did you have to go so far? What were and, and then what were the challenges of shooting in South Africa? Well, number one, it was just the, it was the best location sort of for the movie. You know, though it takes place in an unspecified place, yeah. it um, you know it's really sort of the look that I always liked was sort of the eastern plains of Colorado. So you're coming out of those mountains uh -huh. into the flats, and it really had that look. It had that sort of dust bowl look. If all of that farmland just were totally infertile and suffered a drought, you know, it's, it, it had that same sort of rise, you know, toward the mountains. And was there nothing you could find here that, or was this too expensive? No, then, to then there are other elements. Then, there, then there's just a production element. Right, okay. And so it's less expensive, and we have a, a great South African producer, and they were just an incentive, and, and so it just became a place that was going to be um, sort of ideal to make it. And, and you said the other night though that it got up to 115 degrees. The first two days we shot it was 115 degrees. That that shoot the opening shootout with Mike and uh, and these water bandits. Uh -huh. It was. I mean, and the whole and the whole experience was unbelievably challenging. Uh huh. Um, and it really had a sort of Fitzcarraldo. 
feeling to it when you were out there. It was like just us. We brought everything with us. It was a long trip to get out of there. And so when something went wrong, like when the lights broke, like that was it. And there were nights where we were, it happened twice. The lights blew. Everything we were seeing pitch black in the desert at that house, which had no electricity. It was just movie lights. Right. And it's sort of like everybody, you know, flashlights go on, and that's it. We're ready to go home. Mm. Which means you have to take those lights, drive them a days. You were almost a day to Cape Town, switch them out a day back. Um, oh. So it's I mean, it's just so challenging, and the heat obviously just brings to a whole another element too. Yeah. You um, felt the heat, which I mean, which yeah, is crucial yeah. for the movie. I mean, that helped the movie for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> um. So you had to, you created a whole world, kind of, so you created the, the, the country, this western, you know, this western element, but then how did you do this, like, the city, the cityscapes, was that just all kind of CG, or did, was that? Yeah, because yeah. that was, okay. we, we shot, um, well, we went to Cape Town, so that city, sort of, but then we don't want it to look like Cape Town, we wanted to do right. so, so then we added a lot of those buildings we sort of, we sort of added, uh -huh. and, you know, there are these elements in the film, like the supersonic passenger jet that sort of flies above, that was never totally explained, we're just trying to sort of thread this thing through the movie that makes you feel like there is this world going on outside, that the life that we're living, right. the technology that we have, has expanded outside of the place where the movie's sort of taking place. And you see I, a little bit of it when he crosses the border, you know, the girls flip. I loved her phone, that was phone. so cool. Yeah. Did you just, did you come up with that? I just came up with it, it was a yeah. really, I just had a good idea for it, and then we sort of built the props, guys sort of built a, I mean, we literally made it from like a, a thing. Uh -huh. And, uh, and then digital move the screen. The idea we had is a little. Device. I had phone envy. That was. Yeah. Awesome. No. I mean, <laughs> that that, was great. And that was you know. And I always loved that as a kid. You know. I mean, we would see like Back to the Future or something. And you'd say the hoverboards. And we said. Yeah. Forever. We said the hoverboard exists. The hoverboard really exists. You know. <laughs> so where we have to try. To, and that we've got. I mean, we still hear friends. Too. So. Um. So there's there's all so there's all those futuristic touches like we talked about like the simulator and the. Um, the phone and the, and the medical advances with the mother, yes. kind of keeping the mother alive. Exactly. So she's supposed to like ha she's so supposed she, to be like a pair, like a so amputee. So yeah. She's, a, she's, a, she's an amputee, but she's also quadriplegic. Is the idea? Yeah. So the technology that lets her. So she lives in this mobile community where she essentially lives like a marionette, <clears throat> and it was sort of based on there was one of those toys where you would have like a like a ballerina or something. You press the <sighs> bottom. And she'd yeah, flip yeah, all yeah. Over, then you let it go and it snap up. Yeah. And so the idea is that. Um, sort of plugged into her nervous system is a series of uh, like electrodes, and she's basically being electrocuted, which creates that same kind of tension that the strings in the marionette is, in fact, electricity running through her, you know, hmm. her, her muscles. And so it creates a tension that actually stands her up. And then there's a pneumatic air system, little puffs of air that are making all of her little movements. So that was sort of the thinking behind how to make that work. Right. I mean, it's obviously completely fictional, but it seemed, it, but it seemed yeah. interesting. And then when you pull the plug, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so there's that side. I mean, I just like the dichotomy between that and then him, uh, uh, Michael Shannon listening to, like, 1950s, 1960s music. Yes. Um, what was your thinking there? Like well, that was, so there is, you know, everything is, you know, is now... All the delivery And the shortwave radio or whatever, yeah. All the sort of, like, like, entertainment delivery systems are now basically digital everywhere. Uh -huh. So... And to me, digital uh, has a control element to it. You know, it's all you can stop it, you can change it, you can put uh, key codes and locks and all that stuff on anything, anything digital. Whereas when it was analog and airwaves, you can't stop it. You always think of like Voice of America and all these things we would do in you know, the communist era, you know, the Cold War to sort of get people, you know, democratic Fired ideas up. and yeah. stuff. And now the idea, because you know, obviously our movie is taking these ideas of, you know, if you have a defiant state government, they're not going to have sanctions enacted um, sort of against them by the federal government. That's what's happening in the state where our movie sort of takes place. So they've cut off the internet and television, satellite television. So all those things are going to be just for the flip of a button because all digital now. Yeah. It, it doesn't exist. Like the airwaves are safe now for emergency broadcast system. Right. You know, in the next however many years, there's truly going to be no more analog right. know, television signal. Right. So the idea is running on these ham, what are now you know the ten meter radio systems, how people are communicating and getting their entertainment, and then the idea um, for sort of the, that country music from that era and their sort of the radio shows is that it's all by the time the movie takes place, it's all public domain. Mm. So it's stuff that you don't necessarily need the rights to, mm -hmm. and um, 
it obviously brings a texture to it and it brings a sort of feeling to it. it makes it, you know, it's that sort of like last picture show sort of feeling within this science fiction movie. But there's a logic to it, and so I like both. There, I like the emotional nature of the songs themselves, mm -hmm. and then I like how they got there. Mm -hmm. The idea that it's sort of public. did you have a sense of what time, what year it was in your head? Did you? I mean, I think if we were gonna, because it's as much in the future to me as it is an alternate reality. So, but if we were gonna put it, I mean, it, it's a. Uh, there's one giveaway because Mike has oh. a G-Shock watch, and we were playing with the date. We said, how high will this go? And it stops at a certain number. So that, I guess, would be the year, but it's not quite as far as I guess I thought it would be. It's a little we're also sort of hamstrung a little bit by the automobiles that we could use. You know, we tried to make that sort of like a Cuba 1959 idea that things just stop one day. Right. We're just going to have these sort of, so we picked sort of a mid-90s aesthetic for that. So that's a bit in the, that's certainly in the cars, it's a bit in the clothing. Um, so we, and you see, like being in South Africa and going with whatever resources we have, you know, it sort of like took the movie right. to it, you cool. know. Make it work with what we have. So I just I picked up you know with the John Williams score. There's, there's kind of a Spielberg feel to the movie in a lot of ways, and I just wanted to talk about ask you about your your influences and yeah. who you consider to be your influences. Well, there's def definitely the Spielberg yeah. influence. I think especially uh, sort of. Um, you have a connection. You have a close connection yeah, with him. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's probably the biggest one. I mean, visually, we actually didn't look really at any movies to, to think of how we find the look. That was something that Giles, uh, not just my cinematographer. And I, there's, there's Silent Light, which was a movie that I really liked, uh, about Mennonites in Mexico, mm. was really the only one that I remember we ever thought, oh, I really love the way this movie looks, you know, that, the lensing in that movie was, but beyond that, there were really no movies that we, the writing of it, there were a lot, there were, there were lots of things, and there was, and there was also some anime as well, there were, um, so, you know, uh, the Bresson Oazar Balthazar was a movie that I've always yes. really liked, and that that was a donkey, and ours sort of has the, the, the robot has a bit of that sort of taken from that movie. Mm -hmm. um, the Essie Hinton books were really probably the biggest sort of inspiration, and those movies as well, the, the adaptations, the Coppola adaptations of you know, the Outsiders, yeah. the yeah. Were a big big sort of influence uh, on the picture, just the way the kids sort of. Are that they sort of take place in a, a very storybook yeah. environment. That was something I was really uh, um, interested in. Um, and then there were ones like His and Her Circumstances, which is a, an anime by the guy who did Neon Genesis Evangelion, huh. was one that I really loved. That, and that, there's a lot of like Jerome and Ears, The Girl Across the Border, that has that sort of you know kids that are that have you know suffered or have, you know been forced to kill people uh -huh. or you know there's like or have a sort of you know PTSD from the life the lives that they're living you know, meeting kids with that sort of stuff but done in, a, in an unusual way huh. I mean, I've always really liked anime and, huh. it's interesting um, it's not a natural like you know connection with a no, western I know. Yeah, no I know I mean but those are the ones you know I like the emotional elements of yeah. it. I like it when you know something like a Neon Genesis Evangelion when like when the robots stop fighting you know you're dealing with these kids that, that are really suffering suffering these sort of you know um, internal battles and stuff and, and, I, and, our, and the kids in our movie are all of them especially uh, you know uh, Mary and John yeah, Allen Nick's characters so um, I also felt like the, the chapter things were qu were Tarantino kind of oh yeah, yeah. Like, that, like, that, yeah that, well, that's not intentional but uh, but um, uh, the idea of the chapter headings I think comes more partly from the from Essie Hinton uh -huh. making it as if it were an adaptation of like if she had done a science fiction sort of story uh -huh. um, this is maybe what it would uh -huh. sort of be like that it necessarily would but that sort of my thinking so I like the idea of treating it a little bit like an adaptation that you would feel that each of these three char characters sort of get their section mm -hmm. and um, be very clear and also it makes it a little bit more storybook which I like it made it more movie movie -ish. yeah 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 that's I liked all the different touches that's what I thought was, you know took a lot of paid a lot of attention to detail yeah. Yeah. um so just closing up here you were at Sundance in 1996 with a short and then 2007 with your last feature so what, what's it like being back here this week it's pretty pretty great yeah you know, there's something about this place that, you know, I mean, I feel like, you know, filmmakers in general, you know, it's a, it's, even though it's like such a collaborative thing, there is something very lonely about being a director. And, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like coming to Sundance is like the one club that 
directors who I think for the most part are quite individualistic mm -hmm. would want to sort of be a part it's a of community, it. community, yeah. And, there's, and I find myself here, and I have some other friends who have some pictures here, and, and you know, and, and I saw them at the director's brunch, and, and there's something just really nice about that. Yeah. And, and so I, you know, and I, I'm staying for the whole thing so I can see some movies. You know, Great. Our, our stuff is sort of winding down now. Have you seen anything yet? And no, nothing yet. But now, you know, now it's Monday, so Monday I'm staying till Saturday. So now starting tomorrow, so we'll talk. Saturday. I'll tell you what, uh, what I'd yeah. like. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Please do. Please tell me because that'd be great. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking to the playlist. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs>